بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة وسلام على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. Do you believe God exists? Have you seen God? Do you believe God exists because someone told you God exists? Or do you believe God exists because you've experienced God in your life? Well, brothers and sisters in Islam and respected guests, I'm here today to tell you and stand before you and declare that I believe God exists. I believe God is one, alone with no partners. And I believe this because I've experienced God personally in my life. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran say in Surat al-Fusilat, we will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Fifteen years ago, I sat in the church with my father and my pastor, and I looked at them both straightly, and I said, very frankly, I don't believe in your God, okay? I don't believe in your God. At least, I don't believe Jesus is God. I mean, maybe he was a prophet. Maybe he was a holy man. Maybe he was a myth. Maybe he didn't exist. All I know is, if there is a God, and I'm not sure about that, it wasn't Jesus. And I was very sure of that. Why? Because the Injil, the Bible tells us this. Jesus tells us about himself in the Injil. Verily I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. Well, my definition of God is an all-powerful God. And Jesus just said he had no power except for the Father. But my church said I should worship Jesus as the Lord of the universe. But the Bible tells us, when Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment? They came to him, some scholars. said, what's the most important commandment of all the commandments? And Jesus replied to them, he said, the most important commandment is this. Know, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is haram number one, shirk, associating partners with God. So I sat there in the office with my pastor and I told him and my father, look, I can't be part of your church anymore, okay? I don't even think God exists. It's, God is certainly not Jesus. And you know what? I told God. I prayed and I said, hey God, if you exist, you better send me a sign. You better prove yourself. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe in you. And you know what? I didn't get any sign. So that's it. Probably God doesn't exist. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, but your religion is not for me. So I thought he'd get really angry with me, right? I thought he'd you know, scream and shout at me and maybe kick me out of his office and say, get out of here, you darn blasphemer, you know, but he didn't do that. He, he looked at me, and I still remember his face as he looked at me with very, very calm eyes, and he said something very profound. Actually, he had no idea how right he would be. He said, don't worry, Matthew. I know you will experience God one day. I know it, but you know what? I also know it won't be the way I experience God, and it won't be the way your father experiences God, but I know one day you will experience God. Of that, I'm sure. Well, I didn't give God another thought for a couple of years, right? I was a teenager. I was pretty rebellious as a teenager. And one day my dad uh, sat me down with for a discussion. And he said I had two choices, quit smoking pot or get out of his house. So I got out of his house. I got my own apartment. I moved out on my own. And, uh, you know, as a teenager with not very, a lot of money, I had to get, like, the cheapest place I could, right? So I ended up with this apartment on sort of the wrong side of town, and it was this old, like, Polish mansion. It was huge, like, converted into subdivided, subdivided units. Uh, and the place was haunted, okay, like, full of gene, all right? You know, so we say ghosts uh, in English, but this place was haunted with, like, a capital H. So there were plenty of strange noises from the first moment I moved in, like really weird things. But, you know, I didn't believe in God or the hereafter or angels or demon, any of that nonsense. I was like, oh, it must be the pipes, must be, you know, whatever. And, uh, and then during my first week in the apartment, I was woken up at like 3 in the morning with this knocking on the wall. I was like, that's weird, you know. Maybe, you know, maybe someone's trying to get into someone else's apartment. So I was, I was getting a little nervous. This is very weird, right? But the knocking continued. I started to get a little scared. I was like, what's going on? I, so in my mind, I'm trying to rationalize these things like, okay, what could it be? Could it be the wind? Could it be this? Could it be that? And I couldn't explain it. And the weird thing was, this knocking kept getting closer and closer and closer to me. It went all the way down from one side of my apartment all the way into my bedroom. On the wall. Again and again. Until eventually the noise was right behind my head. 
Now, it's it's no understatement to say I was absolutely terrified. I was like sitting up in bed, completely stiff and and like, oh, what's going on? You know, my hair was standing up, and uh, and you know the noise was right behind my head, and it was knocking and knocking, and, and finally it stopped. I was like, oh, whew. I was very relieved, right? So I laid back down in bed, and I said, oh, thank God. I was like, wait a second, I don't I don't believe in God. Yeah, it was just some you know whatever, it was the wind or something, and then crash. The window of my room slammed shut right in front of my own eyes. There was no wind, not even a breeze. I was terrified. I jumped out of bed, threw on my clothes, grabbed my cell phone, you know, raced out of my apartment. And who's the one person I called? I called my dad. I said, Dad, you got to come get me. I, I can't sleep in my apartment tonight. It's haunted. There's, you know, demons, da 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 da. Like, so he, it, thank God I have a very patient father. He just kind of sighed. <sighs> okay, where are you? I'm coming. I'll pick you up. And uh, so he came and picked me up, and, and on the way back home, I remember something he said to me. He said, uh, you know, Matthew, if you believe in God and you ask for God's protection, God will protect you, and God is all-powerful, so you have nothing to fear. And that stuck with me. But for the first time in my life, I was forced to confront that there's this, this world, or there's this realm that I can't see and I can't explain. The Quran says in... in uh, Surat number 6, uh, verse 104, Now have come to you from your Lord proofs to open your eyes. If you will see, it will be for the good of your own soul. So a year or so later, I started researching other religions. I thought, okay, maybe there's this other realm. And I was kind of looking for something. And so I studied Buddhism. I studied Hinduism. I read the Bhagavad Gita. Um, I even tried yoga. I practiced yoga for a while. But for some reason, I was drawn back to the Bible. Maybe because it was familiar. So I gave God my same arrogant challenge as when I was a, a younger teenager, right? I said, okay, God, send me a sign. If you send me a sign, I promise to believe in you and to worship you. So I was reading the Bible, and, and also I was uh, very broke, still, a, still a, uh, no college education. Uh, I was starting, studying at a technical school, but I really had no work experience. I worked in fast food. That was about it. And I really needed money, right? And so a Home Depot was hiring, and they paid double the minimum wage, which I thought was awesome, right? So I, uh, I applied, the interview went really well, and they hired me. But there was one final thing. I needed to pass a drug test. Big problem, big problem, okay? So this is haram number three, intoxication. So it was not possible for me to pass a drug test, all right? Not with the amount of pot I was smoking in those days. So I needed this job really bad, so I, I was like, well, what else can I do? I'm not gonna, so I prayed. I was like, dear God, if you, if you exist, you know, really would like this job, so please help me, and P.S., that would be a, a great sign to prove you exist. Thank you very much. Love, Matthew. Right? And uh, so the, text, the test was the very next day after my interview, and the hiring manager specifically told me, we'll call you 24 hours after the test to tell you the results. So I waited, and 24 hours went by, and I got no call. And 48 hours went by, still no call. Finally, a whole week went by, no call. So I said, okay, God, I get it. I was so arrogant. I was stupid. I get it. I shouldn't be smoking pot. And I missed out on this great job because of that. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry, God. The next day, the phone rang. Hi, this is Jen from Home Depot. When can you start? I was shocked. God had answered my prayer. And I got the job. But more importantly, I got a very important sign. I said, okay, God, I get it. You're there. I believe in you. And turn to Allah in repentance, all of you, O believers, that you might succeed. Surat An-Nur. So only after I repented, earnestly and sincerely repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did I find success. So I started this job at Home Depot, right? And it was my dream job, but the dream didn't last for long. If any of you have ever worked at a place like Home Depot, you know it's, it's, a very, it's very difficult work. It's not easy. Uh, and there's a reason why they were paying double the minimum wage. Uh, so I worked in lumber and building materials, so I spent all my day you know, driving around forklifts and like schlepping bags of concrete and, and moving around lumber and loading up trucks. And you know, This honestly was not the high-tech software job that I had in mind. So I started to get a little depressed about this. I started to think about quitting my job. Now by this time, I had started reading the Bible pretty regularly. So one day when I was really down, I was thinking, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to quit this job. Forget about it. Like, I'm just going to, I'll find something else. I'll just, I won't even call him. I'll just never come back, right? That's it. But I was like, okay, you know, God, like, 
give me some guidance, right? So this, this is how I'm don't do this, but I, I took the Bible and I said, okay, God, give me guidance. And I open it up and it's like randomly to the first page and read what's on the first page, the first thing I see. And this is what I read from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, uh, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might and strength. SubhanAllah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in, in verse 83 of Surat al-Isra, uh, al when we bestow favors upon mankind, he turns his back and withdraws to one side. But when evil befalls him, he despairs. How true is that? This is haram number four, ungratefulness. So I felt ashamed. I had prayed for this, this job and I had this amazing you know, intervention in my life and I would got this great job that I prayed for and I was willing to just throw it in the trash. So I didn't quit my job. I went to work that day and I decided that day I would try to be the best possible Home Depot employee they'd ever seen, right? With a smile on my face, super duper helpful. The more annoying the customers were, the more I just smiled and, and helped them out, right? And uh, after all, God had helped me to get the job. The least I could do is be helpful to the customers. So towards the end of the day, there was a particular, uh, particularly, how should we say, uh, challenging customer. Okay, this guy had me going all over the store. He really didn't know what he wanted. I was pulling stuff from high and low all over the store. Uh, but I just smiled and I tried my, my best to be helpful and friendly. And uh, after I, I concluded the sale and we loaded up his truck with all the materials, he shook my hand and he looked me in the eyes and he smiled. And he said, you know, I really like your attitude. I could really use someone like you at, at my company. I own a small electronics company and I'd like you to come in and work for me. SubhanAllah, my face just lit up like a light bulb. That's what he told me later. He said, my face, your face lit up like a light bulb when I told you that. I was so excited. So he ended up hiring, and you know what he said to me? He, said, he was a Christian man. You know what he said to me after he hired me? He told me, these are his exact words, God put it in my heart to hire you. SubhanAllah. So I started in this company in the lowest paid position. I was... Uh, Instead of assembling electronics, they had me start out assembling cardboard boxes. <laughs> it wasn't very glamorous work, but it was a start. It was a foot in the door, as we say. But within two and a half years, I'd been promoted and promoted until eventually I was managing the largest uh, group within the company with a team of five working for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surat al-Ibrahim, uh, verse number seven, If you are grateful, I will surely give you more and more. So God had blessed me with this great career path and amazing opportunities. And eventually I had an opportunity to move out here to California and start working in the Silicon Valley, uh, which was awesome. And, uh, you know, so all the tech action is out here. And I'd love to, to, to sit here and tell you that, you know, after all those great experiences, I dedicated my life to God and just, you know, left all the haram and, and that was it. But that, that wouldn't be true. Uh, so honestly, I wasn't practicing any religion. I had never gone back to Christianity because, like I said, I never believed Jesus was God or a God. So I never went back to Christianity and I hadn't really looked for a replacement. Uh, so I was just kind of floating out there. You know, I was like letting the current of the world just kind of take me. And I came to California and I was like, oh, wow, groovy, man. Everything's cool. You know, like try it all out. Right. And, uh, you know, when you move across the country, uh, if, if some of you may have moved from from faraway places, you, if you move, especially if you're alone, you become a bit depressed. Right. And so there was an emptiness inside of me, and I began to try to fill that emptiness with, with different things, with alcohol, with smoking more marijuana. And then there were California girls also. This is haram number five, zina, unlawful sex. So the first serious relationship I had in my life was with an Iranian girl. She was literally fresh off the airplane, not fresh off the boat, because we don't take boats anymore. But she'd been in the country a week when we went on our first date. And so to her, I was probably this like bad, pot-smoking, drinking, motorcycle-riding you know, guy. But to me, she was this, this beautiful, exotic, otherworldly type of, type of person. And uh, in fact, on our second date, I, I still remember she was telling me a little bit about her religion. And she's like, oh yeah, in my religion, uh, a man can have four wives. And I, I laughed. I thought she was joking. I laughed in her face and I feel bad now because I insulted her actually. But, uh, you know, she, uh, we grew closer and closer uh, in our fondness for one another. But it was a forbidden relationship. It was a haram relationship. And she hid me from her family for, for many months. Um, but as things got more and more serious, we started to consider a future together. So eventually she introduced me to her, to her family. And... They actually really liked me, and believe it or not, they accepted me. But there was just one thing. She said, well, if we're going to have a future together, if you want to marry me, you have to become Muslim. 
I was like, I have to become Muslim? I was like, you're not even practicing. Why should I become a Muslim? Like, what's so special about your religion that I should take your religion, you know? But I was like, okay, that's that's fine. I don't have a religion. You know, I can say, oh, maybe I'll declare I'm Muslim, but maybe it's just going to be in words. But anyway, I'm a technical guy. I'm an engineer, right? So I wanted to learn, you know, technically, what am I getting myself into, right? I wanted to read the fine print of the religion, right? So I started studying Islam from sort of an academic perspective. Uh, so, you know, I... Uh, I started to study Islam, and actually my mom was very supportive. She bought me a DVD lecture series on Islam. It was sort of a very academic study of Islam. And I started really enjoying what I was learning. The more I learned about Islam, the more I realized, wow, this is kind of already what I believe. This is great. And, uh, and it's, you know, Islam seemed like what I already believed. But uh, this part of my story doesn't end the way you might be thinking. Uh, because in 2011, we went to this Valentine's Day party, and when we left the party, I noticed the way she was looking at another guy, and with one week, within one week, we had broken up. It wasn't the right match. It was not the right match. So this, this future we've been dreaming and planning of, uh, planning for together, was instantly torn apart, right? And I, I, we were both really torn up about it. Um, but, you know, I, I felt in a way like a part of my identity had been, had been taken from me. And... I mean, I'd, e I'd even learned Farsi for this girl, right? I actually speak uh, semi-fluent Farsi to this day. And, you know, all that was sort of taken from me. And I was still reading Quran and learning about Islam. And I thought, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to continue doing this. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm interested in this. I'll just continue learning. So in my heartbreak, I sort of drew near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in learning about Islam. Surely by the remembrance of Allah, our hearts set at rest. In Surat Al-Ra'd. So I wasn't looking for religion, again, I was looking for comfort. But the more I learned about Islam, the more comfort I found. And the more beautiful I realized that Islam really was. And then one night I had a dream. This wasn't an ordinary dream. This was a very, very vivid dream. And in this dream, I was praying salat in a masjid, in community, in jama'ah. And when I made sujood, I had the most amazing feeling come into my body feeling of taqwa, or God consciousness. Brothers and sisters, I cannot describe the beauty of this feeling I felt in my heart. And that was it. When I woke up, I said, this is a clear sign. I accept the religion of Islam. I'm Muslim now. I believe, God, you are one alone with no partners, and I believe Muhammad is your messenger. And that was it. That's how I became Muslim. Allahu Akbar. So the easy part was over, <laughs> right? I woke up, I was like, okay, I'm Muslim now, all right. But Islam is not just a religion of faith, right? Islam is a religion of action. So the problem was for me, my original study of Islam was like an academic exercise. I didn't know the, the practical aspects of Islam. For example, I knew there were five daily prayers, but how should I pray? Like, what do I actually have to do? You know, I knew there was something... Uh, you know, I knew I should wash before prayer, but how do I wash? What do I wash? When do I wash? Right? All those practical aspects. What about going to the masjid? If I go to a mosque, what will they say? Will they believe I'm Muslim? Will they think I'm a spy? Like, I don't know. What do Muslims think about Americans who become Muslims? I have no idea. Right? So, believe it or not, I was so afraid to go to masjid. I was a Muslim for an entire year, and I didn't go to a masjid because I didn't know what to do. So, uh, you know, this didn't... This, Personally, it didn't happen to me, but I, I heard a, a story at a local masjid here, not this one, in the Bay Area, and they had a khalaqa and a dinner, and there was a, a, a new revert to Islam. A brother went there, and they were having the dinner, and now this brother was left-handed, and he ate the food with his left hand, and uh, someone who was, who was not maybe a very learned person said, Brother, don't you know that's haram? The food is in the hellfire, and was like yelling at him. And this is his first time in a masjid. Do you think he came back? No, he didn't come back to that masjid. No, who knows what he, uh, if he stayed with the deen or not? I don't know. Alhamdulillah, this didn't happen to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, they never saw that brother again. But uh, these brothers and sisters in Islam are, are the, the things we struggle with is, is reverts to Islam when we enter Islam. It's the, it's the practical aspects of, of the fiqh, right? And uh, so I'll tell you about my first time at a masjid. So I went to Tawheed here in, in, up in San Francisco. And uh, I had started kind of figuring out how to pray. I, I hadn't memorized Surat Al-Fatiha yet, but uh, I kind of knew the basics. But not really, I was still very uncomfortable. And uh, no one greeted me when I first went in, so I just kind of like went in the masjid and like sat there. I was like, okay, what's going to happen? Are they going to kick me out? Like, 
Alhamdulillah, a, a brother came in to pray. It was sort of in between prayers. And a brother came in and he, he said, oh, let's, brother, have you prayed yet? I said, no, I haven't prayed yet. He said, okay, let's pray together. You lead. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't lead. He said, why not? Go ahead, lead. I said, no, I can't lead because I don't know how to pray. He said, okay, okay, no problem. I'll show you. This is, which is great. He very simply showed me. He made it very simple for me. He said something like, okay, all you need to do is follow me. Follow the leader. Okay, that's easy. He said, every time I say Allahu Akbar, you say Allahu Akbar too. Okay, I know what Allahu Akbar means. Okay, I'm, I'm down. Sign me up. So, uh, so he led me in prayer, and, and we prayed together. And then after, he, he talked to me for a little bit, and, and it, was, it was very nice. And uh, he didn't go into too much detail. He just gave me a very nice explanation, alhamdulillah. So this was my first experience uh, in a masjid. And also I can say YouTube also helped me enormously in the early days. There are the, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all the people doing dawah on YouTube. It's a very, very good resource. Uh, but the basics of spiritual practice are sort of only one side of the equation, right? In order to really practice Islam and follow the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I needed to change my lifestyle, right? And to the young brothers and sisters here, I'll give you this warning about alcohol and drugs. They are very addictive. They're not toys, okay? So when someone becomes addictive, to alcohol or drugs, it's not just like a chocolate. Like, oh, I don't feel like chocolate today. Okay, I'm not going to have chocolate. No, you need your chocolate every day. Okay, it's very serious. So it's uh, it's very hard to to leave those things. And the other thing about drugs and alcohol is, you don't realize it, but when you when you're someone who's a, a pot smoker or a drinker, you start to surround your community becomes all your friends and all your the people who you hang out with are only people who use those substances, right? If you're a, a drunk person and you're with non, no people who are not drunk, you don't feel good. You realize what you're doing is not great and you realize you sound stupid and it's not fun, right? So what you do is you start to surround yourself with only a group of people who, who do what you do, right? So it's not, it's, addiction is hard enough in itself, but also distancing yourself from the people who are potentially leading you back to the haram, right? That's very important. So, uh, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with... Uh, a, a story that's recorded by Imam Bukhari in his, his book of uh, Sahih Hadith. So the man, there was a man who, uh, he'd murdered 99 people, Sh nodding your heads if you've heard this, this Hadith. So the man had murdered 99 people, he went to the masjid, he talked to a, a man of knowledge, and the first, the first person he talked to really didn't grasp what he was saying, and he said, you murdered 99 people? No way, you, you, can't, you can't be uh, forgiven. And so he said, okay, I'll just make you the, the 100 person then, and he kills the guy, right? And then he, he talks to another person, and the person says, yes, you can be forgiven, but you, my suggestion, you have to leave the people you're hanging out with, right? You have to, you have to go to a new neighborhood. And there's different uh, narrations of, of how the story ends, but he dies halfway to making his journey to his, his new home, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grants him Jannah, because he made the, the niyyah, he made the intention, and he, he started on his journey to leave this, uh, these friends that were bringing him back to the haram. So this is very important. Uh, and it's not easy. But the point I want to un emphasize here is you need to surround yourself with good people who have a positive influence on you because the people you hang out with will have a, a major influence on you. And so a year after embracing Islam, I was still struggling with intoxicants until one day when I was praying Salat and I made sujood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me the shame of all the money I had wasted and all the time I had wasted and all the intellect that I had squandered on, on being intoxicated for so much of my life. And I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed. While I was still in sujood, I, I cried and cried and I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, never again, I swear, never again will I touch intoxicants. And alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters in Islam, I can, I can say to you today, since that time I have never gone even near to intoxicants. Allahu Akbar. So, uh, yeah, so I, alhamdulillah, I, I kept true to that promise. Um, I, and honestly, I can't begin to describe how much better, how much happier I, I am in my life overall. So, you know, when you, take, uh, when you take those steps, alhamdulillah, you, you, you know, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not just give you spiritual success, but it gives you success in the dunya and the akhirah, success in, in this life and the next. And alhamdulillah, I can say that is so true. So, uh, yeah, so uh, one area I had success in was, was my career, alhamdulillah. So I actually ended up starting my own tech business. But I had a problem with, with cash flow. Yani, uh, cash flow is like, you know, you sell some products and you get paid later, right? So in my business, I had this problem with cash flow. I was selling products but getting paid a long time after. 
So I talked to my, uh, my non-believing uh, business advisors, and they said, oh, just go to the bank and take a loan. That's, that's it. It's easy, very easy. I said, wait a second, I have, I'm, I'm following Islam. I can't just take a loan and pay riba, right? Riba is haram. This is, the, this is the next haram. So I was like, what do I do, right? So what did I do? I went back to YouTube. So many of us know uh, that, uh, many of us know that, you know, interest and usury are, are prohibited, but how many of us actually know what the Islamic uh, suggested mode of financing is, right? How many of us know about mudaraba and musharaka, right? And murabaha. These are things that many of us don't know about in our community. And it's unfortunate because the deeper, the deeper I went into research these, researching these things, this is similar with all the other research I did in Islam, the more beautiful I found it is. The more beautiful I, I found that the fiqh of business actually is. And uh, most of the brothers and sisters I've talked to about Islamic business, they have no concept of, of musharaka or mudarabah or any of these things. And it's really unfortunate because I feel this really as a community puts us at a loss. Because the, the scholars have, have gone so deep in this and just a basic understanding of, of these fiqh issues can go a long way. SubhanAllah, like, you know, the deen and, and the, the fiqh of, of worship is something that influences every day, right? Praying five times a day. But also every day we go to the store, we conduct business, we have a job. So we have to make sure that those things that we're doing in our life every day are also following the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, yeah, so I made, it, uh, I made it my decision to, and my mission to help Muslim businesses to, to get financing in a halal way using these principles of mudaraba and musharaka. And that's why I created my company Blossom. Our website's blossomfinance.com. Happy to talk to any of you about that. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for inviting me and, and Jazakallah khair for the organizers and, and I'm happy to answer any questions about anything I've said or in general anything about my journey to Islam, uh, inshallah. Thank you.